Good afternoon. Today we are going to dive into the second session of Communicable Disease Epidemiology. At the end of this session, all students should be able to explain the concept of disease control. Next we look at describing the methods of control of communicable diseases. Define and differentiate the terms endemic, epidemic and pandemic. And finally, outline the steps involved in investigation of outbreaks. Please note that to achieve the last learning outcome, there is another lecture recording which you all need to listen to in order to understand the detailed steps of outbreak investigation. In today's session, I will only be outlining and listing the steps which are involved. So let's begin with understanding what is the concept of disease control. When we use the term disease control or control of diseases, it describes activities which are aimed at reducing the incidence of disease. Incidence refers to occurrence of new cases of a disease. So when we say that a particular disease has been controlled in the community, it means that there are no longer new cases of the disease occurring. Second is reduction in the duration of the disease and ultimately the risk of transmission which means that if a person who is suffering from disease is treated the duration of his suffering or symptoms automatically gets reduced and by this we are able to achieve interruption of transmission the risk of the agent being transmitted from that person to a susceptible host is taken care of the third thing is by reducing the effects of the infection now any particular disease might have physical or psychosocial complications. So by reducing or by controlling the disease, we are trying to reduce the effects of the infection. And finally, this also reduces the financial burden to the community. Now how does this happen? When we are sick, we stay away from work. And staying away from work or absence from work means loss of productivity to the industry in which the person is working. By this way, there is a financial burden. By reducing, the disease, by reducing the occurrence of disease or by controlling the disease, we can reduce the financial burden to the community. So this is the concept of disease control. Now let's move on to understanding what are the principles of disease control. With reference to this, we need to understand three terminologies. The first one is control, which we have already looked at. Control basically emphasizes on reduction of disease incidence. We do not want new cases of the disease to occur. That is the concept of control or that is the principle behind achieving control. The second one is elimination. When we talk about a disease which has been eliminated, it means that the infectious agent no longer exists in the human host. So we cannot find the infectious agent inside the human host. It, it means it is eliminated from the human host. Whereas the term eradication refers to complete removal of the infectious agent or the organism in all its forms. It could be either spore form or a vegetative form. And this happens not only from the human hosts, but also from the environmental reservoirs. So we are removing the organism completely from wherever it can be found or wherever it can survive. So that is eradication. So if you, if you look at the process, we can, when we are looking at eradication, we first need to achieve elimination. And before achieving elimination, control is very, very important. But these all three essentially form the principles of disease control. Now let's look at a bit of detail about elimination and eradication. When we talk about disease elimination, we are talking about interrupting the transmission of disease. This is very important because when we talk about elimination, we can see here that there is disease transmission occurring, but we are planning to interrupt it. We are planning to stop it. Examples of disease elimination are elimination of the disease measles. Now measles is a viral infection which is spread by the respiratory route and it affects young children. By vaccinating maximum number of younger children, we have been able to remove occurrence or existence of the measles virus from these children. So that is elimination of measles. Another example is 
diphtheria the elimination of diphtheria which is a bacterial infection caused by corynebacterium diphtheriae it also affects young children and by giving the vaccine we have been able to eliminate diphtheria from large geographic areas point to remember here is as we go on achieving more and more elimination across different regions we we are very close to eradication so it is said that regional elimination is a very important precursor that is the step before eradication so what is then disease eradication disease eradication has been defined as a process of termination of all transmission of infection by extermination of the infectious agent earlier we saw that in elimination it talks about interruption of transmission whereas eradication talks about termination or end of all transmission and how do we achieve this by removing the infectious agent how is the infectious agent removed that is through managerial techniques known as surveillance and containment which we will learn in a moment disease eradication implies that this disease which we are talking about will no longer exist or no longer occur in the population and the best example of eradication so far has been smallpox which was a viral disease so now when we say that smallpox has been eradicated it means that no longer does smallpox virus exist both in the humans as well as in the environment so that's about elimination and eradication now let's actually look at what are the methods of disease control as you can see here there are five methods which have been given under disease control first is elimination of reservoir so you remove the reservoir or rather you remove the 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 place where the organism can survive and can multiply and replicate and be ready for transmission second interruption of transmission third protection of the susceptible host fourth is surveillance and containment and last is notification and legislation of these five the first three that is elimination of reservoir interruption of transmission and protection of the susceptible host are linked to the chain of infection if we want to achieve these methods of control we are essentially breaking the chain of infection so looking at the chain of infection we have the reservoir the agent mode of transmission susceptible host so we are going to target three areas of this chain of infection and break the chain of infection so that transmission doesn't occur so first is elimination of the reservoir now reservoirs as we all know could be human plant environmental animal anybody so if we are able to eliminate the reservoir or the place where the organism can stay multiply survive then we can largely achieve disease control so for example if we have a person suffering from tuberculosis how do we eliminate this person acts as the reservoir for tuberculosis how do we eliminate this reservoir by treating the person so that no longer mycobacterium tuberculosis can be present in that particular individual and if there is no agent there is no question of transmission occurring so this is just one example of how we can eliminate the reservoir the second could be elimination of an environmental reservoir for example if we have breeding sites for mosquitoes if we could remove those breeding sites we can largely eliminate the reservoir and essentially we can achieve disease control the second could be interruption of transmission so what if we are not able to eliminate the reservoir and the agent is already present in the environment so we can achieve interruption of transmission by targeting the mode of transmission so if it is going to be mosquitoes as the mode of transmission we can reduce the number of adult mosquitoes or the breeding sites so that the transmission is interrupted so the virus or the agent may have multiplied but if we reduce the vectors which are going to transmit the virus we can still achieve control and last one is protecting the susceptible host now what if we if we are not able to eliminate the reservoir completely or we are not able to interrupt the transmission we can focus on protecting the susceptible host 
Take the example of dengue again. Protecting the susceptible host for against dengue would be by using mosquito repellents, using mosquito treated bed nets or using screens for the windows, using long sleeve clothing etc. By doing all this we are able to reduce the contact of the susceptible host with the vector so that when there is no contact there is no question of transmitting the virus from the vector to the susceptible host. So these are components of breaking the chain of infection. Now these were the first three parts of methods of disease control. Now moving to the next two, before we touch on surveillance we need to understand one more terminology which is used interchangeably with surveillance and that's called as monitoring. Now monitoring is considered to be the performance and analysis of routine measurements, routine which are done regularly or can be done every day. And why do we need to do it? So that we are able to detect any changes either in the environment or in the health status of the population study. Let's look at examples. Now this first one is a map which shows you few numbers and you can see that around every number there is a color. Now this is a map which shows you the API or the air pollutant index in different states in Malaysia. Some time ago there was this problem of haze whereby the environment was highly polluted and the outside air was not of good quality for us to breathe. So how did we know whether the air is of good quality, whether we should go out or we should stay indoors? This was done with the help of daily monitoring of air pollutant index which was suggesting the quality of air in the environment. So depending on this index or the value as you can see there in the circle, people were instructed whether they can leave their homes or they need to stay indoors. Now this is a very important uh, change which was detected in the environment and this change wa be because it was likely to affect the health of humans. So depending on whether the API was high or low, people were advised whether to they can go out or stay indoors. This was a very important preventive step and it is, it is being done routinely, it is being done every day, every minute. So that is about API. Another way of monitoring um, an environmental change is this. This is known as a water sampling point, this particular structure. Inside there will be a pipeline carrying water which will carry water to the people's homes for domestic use. There is a place whereby in this particular sampling center whereby water will be collected and it will be sent for physical, chemical and microbiological investigation. Now this is very important because the water which is going to reach us and we are going to use us, use it whether it is safe to use or not is being detected by sampling water from this water sampling unit and this is a part of water quality monitoring because this is for the safety and health of large populations or people across a particular region or the whole country. So these were two examples whereby we said that we are monitoring environment and the changes to check whether it has got an effect on the health of populations. The next one is this. This is a chart which shows plotting of weight and height for age of children under 5 years. So as you can see age is given across the x axis and y along the y axis is the weight and the height of children. Now this monitoring is done right from birth until 5 years of age. Every month the child is brought to the healthcare facility and his weight and height is taken and this is plotted on this graph and against these reference lines. So if the child falls along these lines it means the growth and the development of the child is appropriate. But if this line starts deviating from what is considered as normal we can say that this child is having problems with growth and development. These problems can be identified early and complications can be prevented. So that is the rationale behind doing growth and development monitoring for children. So please do remember monitoring is for routine measurements which can be done either for environment or for individuals. Now let's move on to what is surveillance. Now surveillance is ongoing systematic collection, collation, analysis and interpretation of data. Now what is this data all about? This data is all about different changes in disease trends or it could also be 
disasters or it could be any forthcoming emergency and this data is collected it is ongoing it never stops it is collected it is organized it's analyzed and this data is then converted into information which is interpreted and it is disseminated to the relevant people or agencies so these are this these basically summarizes surveillance as information for action we are creating information so that some action can be taken to protect the health of people at large following other objectives of surveillance first to provide information about new and changing trends in the health status of a population now the word trend means that we have to have an ongoing system whereby we can check what is happening to a particular disease or a condition for example how do we know that dengue is always present in a particular population or dengue has a seasonal occurrence it will the number of cases will rise during a particular season this is by collecting data regularly about dengue about the number of new cases about the deaths and about the localities where dengue is more prevalent second is to provide timely warning of any public health disasters so this is very important to identify that there could be an emergency or a disaster if we can identify it early we can plan interventions or we can plan activities so that many people can be saved or many people can be protected against the disaster and last and very important objective is based on this system we can provide feedback to the policy makers from the ministry of health so that if there are any existing programs which do not work or they need to mod be modified based on the surveillance data they can be modified so that the objectives which are designed for that program could be redefined or they may have to be changed depending on the surveillance data so these are the objectives of surveillance let's now look at what is the surveillance system for dengue in malaysia as i have already mentioned there is an app known as i dengue and you can also open it on the website and you can see the real time picture of dengue all across malaysia you can see the number of cases number of deaths the hotspot localities hotspots are nothing but the places where there is ongoing dengue transmission now these are high risk transmission areas so if you find hotspot localities the healthcare fun healthcare personnel will go and monitor whether they can reduce the risk of transmission in that particular area so by a continuous surveillance about dengue we can see how we can prevent occurrence of dengue or we can reduce the incidence of dengue so this app is an excellent example of technology or technology and surveillance where we can prevent the deadly disease dengue um this is called as the surveillance loop whereby as you can see there are arrows going in one particular direction and nowhere does this stop so how to explain this surveillance loop this is the healthcare system or your hospitals or healthcare units from where an event or a disease is reported to the surveillance center now surveillance center is a place where all the data from different hospitals and different healthcare units will be collected they it will be organized or collated and analyzed as well as interpreted converted to information now this information is then fed back and recommendations are given for action to the relevant agencies and this continues so that's why this is called as a surveillance loop there is no point of time when this surveillance system stops that's why we use the word ongoing when we define surveillance so this in a nutshell is the ministry of health malaysia surveillance systems point to be understood over here is there is a system which we are going to talk about today which is known as mandatory notification of disease surveillance which is also called as notification of diseases whereby all the public and the private healthcare facilities that is private health centers sorry public healthcare centers and hospitals private gp clinics and hospitals they all are supposed to notify diseases to the nearest district health office which in turn will disseminate the information to the state health department 
and finally this information goes to the Na national disease control division of the ministry of health so as you can see the system for notification of disease starts with the hospital or the healthcare centers and ultimately this information reaches up to the national disease control division other than the healthcare facilities there are several other uh, centers or surveil, uh, several other agencies which are also involved as a part of MOH surveillance systems and they are the laboratories, then they are the clinic based, community based and the zoonotic diseases or department of veterinary services which all so as you can see this is a network or this is a big surveillance system and the work in these surveillance systems is goes on continuously it never stops. So let's move on to understanding a bit of history of communicable disease control in Malaysia. For the first time in 1971, the epidemiology unit was established in the Ministry of Health, which was fully operational only in 1996, followed by which there was an act known as the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988 for notification of communicable diseases. As we saw earlier, we saw notification and legislation. So these two terms are very closely linked because we as doctors are supposed to notify the diseases which have been listed in this list of 27 notifiable diseases. If we fail to notify these diseases, we can be punished by law and that's why notification and legislation are mentioned together. As you can see here, there is a list of 27 diseases of which 9 diseases must be notified by phone. So let's look at the list of diseases. These are the 9 diseases which have to be notified by phone within the first 24 hours. What do I mean by this? If you are the medical officer and you see a case of dengue fever now, just now, you it is your legal duty to call the nearest district health office within the next 24 hours and notify the this case to the district health office. After having notified the case on phone, you also have to use the e-system or the electronic communication system whereby all the details of this case can be notified to the district health office. However, the first step is notifying by phone. The other diseases in this list are yellow fever, diphtheria, Ebola, food poisoning, cholera, plague, poliomyelitis and rabies. So these are the nine diseases which must be notified within the first 24 hours when you see them and this notification has to be done by phone. Now the rest of the notifiable diseases are as you can see in this table they have to be given by a written notification to the district health office within a week. So within seven days you can notify these diseases which are listed here through written notification. There is no requirement for you to make a phone call to notify these diseases. The point to remember here is or to understand here is the list of diseases which have been given here may be modified in future. As of now this list exists. You are not required to mug up or uh, to learn by heart all the diseases however it's mandatory for you to remember the nine diseases which are notified by phone notification by phone suggests the emergency or the urgency of notifying these diseases how urgent or how much of a public health threat they pose to people is given by the requirement that they need to be notified by phone so please do remember the nine diseases so to sum up, when we talk about control of infectious diseases, we need to understand there are four C's in disease control. First is the cases. Second is the contacts. Contacts are people who either take care of the cases or who stay in close proximity to the cases. It could be family members or relatives who stay uh, in the same house or who share the same environment as the case. Then we have the carriers, people who apparently have no symptoms but who have the organism in their body and the last is the community at large so to achieve control of cases we need to diagnose the case notify the case to the appropriate health authorities we need to isolate the case if necessary 
disinfection so if we are dealing with the case of tuberculosis we need to disinfect the secretions of the person suffering from tuberculosis because it might contain the organism and it is likely to be transmitted to others next is treatment of the case so essentially we are eliminating the reservoir when we treat the case then we follow the case up and release now release is applicable only to those cases who are hospitalized contacts contacts have to be observed for development of symptoms if contacts develop symptoms they automatically become case and so the control for those refers to the individual cases then for carriers it's very important to detect the carriers and to treat them so that they do not become reservoirs and for the community in order to control an infectious disease what is important to do is an epidemiological investigation as well as containment containment refers to stopping the epidemic or the outbreak which has occurred in the community so with reference to that we are going to learn three terms endemic epidemic and pandemic what is an endemic endemic refers to constant presence of a disease or infectious agent within a given geographic area or a population group so if i say that dengue is endemic in malaysia i'm correct because this disease is always present in any given part of the country or in in given populations so we know that there will always be certain number of cases of dengue in the population and that's why we call it as the usual or expected frequency of disease frequency is nothing but number or counts so we know that in a particular area in malaysia these many will be the cases of the disease which will always be present so we can say that dengue is endemic in malaysia then we have epidemic epidemic is an unusual occurrence in a community or region of a disease or a specific health related behavior or other health related events clearly in excess of the expected occurrence so we know from the endemic definition or in the definition of endemic that it is an expected frequency or an expected occurrence when there is an unusual occurrence which is clearly in excess of the expected occurrence we have to label it as an epidemic so in an epidemic what is important to remember is the number of cases will be suddenly increased in that given area or in that given locality in the given period of time it could also be it doesn't have to be necessarily a disease it could also be a health related events maybe um occurrence of accidents we know that certain number of accidents do occur every day or there is an expected number of accidents but if suddenly during festive season or during any other time accident the number of accidents increases it could suggest an epidemic of accidents now then alternative term which is used for epidemic is called as an outbreak we use the term outbreak when it is usually a small localized epidemic what do i mean by localized is for example if there is large number of cases of food poisoning which occurs in a cafeteria of a school after eating a particular meal we would term it as an outbreak rather than an epidemic because it is localized or it is very specific only to that school but why we consider it to be an outbreak is because clearly there has been an excess number of people falling sick in that particular area in a given time so please do remember epidemic is for larger regions whereas outbreak is more localized and for smaller regions there is another term with reference to endemicity which is called as hyper endemic so as the word endemic is there you need to remember that there is constant presence of the disease but why is the word hyper used in front of endemic is because this disease which is constantly present has to be present at a higher incidence rate or a prevalence rate that means many number of cases will be occurring and it will be affecting all the age groups equally so irrespective of all, any age all the people will be affected by the disease and this disease will be constantly present in the population that's why it is called as hyper endemic 
and the last term here is pandemic a pandemic is an epidemic usually affecting a large proportion of population and occurring over wide geographic area so a pandemic essentially involves major regions of the world so if you say that a worldwide epidemic is an pandemic is a pandemic that is true so an epidemic which spreads across regions so i have shown you examples of sars influenza pandemics all over the world so they have the propensity to spread and affect large regions of the world so they are called as pandemics so if you have to graphically represent an endemic and an epidemic we can say that with time endemic is constant presence at as you can see that this is the usual or the expected frequency when this frequency suddenly rises the number suddenly rises it it can be considered as epidemic so please do remember a disease which is endemic can have an epidemic potential it can become an epidemic and that's how by surveillance we can understand we can check whether a particular endemic disease is reaching epidemic proportions and if we can find that out preventive measures can be initiated to control it there is one more term which you need to know as students of epidemiology which is called as sporadic the word sporadic means scattered ab about that means there is no particular time or reason why the cases will occur but there will be a haphazard occurrence of the cases from time to time and this will be infrequent it cannot be you cannot pinpoint that the case will occur now or it should occur then okay. examples of sporadic nature of uh, disease spread are tetanus and meningococcal meningitis then if it is so infrequent and you know it occurs once in a while why do we need to think about sporadic we need to know about sporadicity of a particular condition reason being a sporadic disease could be a start of an epidemic when the conditions are favorable for its spread because most of the disease transmission or we are looking at favorable conditions whereby an endemic can be converted into an epidemic so similar concept applies to a sporadic disease also right now there is only occasional one or two cases but if the conditions are favorable or they are much in favor of the agent to spread even a sporadic condition can become an epidemic so we need to be aware of these conditions now a very important topic in the subject of epidemiology is plotting or knowing what is an epidemic curve an epidemic curve is a graphical representation of number of cases of a disease occurring over time so as you can see in this particular graph here you have on the x axis time and on the y axis you have frequency or the number of cases this is the time when the infectious agent attacks or is able to be Uh, to enter the susceptible host or in other words the host is exposed to the infectious agent this case is known as an index case the first person to be infected with the organism now there is a gap between the exposure and actually the the curve to start off and this is nothing but the incubation period so the time taken between the receipt of infection or the exposure to the first occurrence of symptoms as you can see here there was only one case affected and now slowly the number of cases has increased following which there has been a reduction in the number of cases and ultimately the cases come to the baseline this is called as an epidemic curve whereby all the number of the all the cases they start occurring and then later according to the natural history of the disease the cases are treated or they get better and that's why the number of cases come get on go on decreasing this is known as an epidemic curve now earlier we saw a curve but the similar thing has been represented using what we call as a histogram if you join the midpoints of these histograms histogram you can find the similar curve which we saw in the earlier slide this type of spread of the disease is called as a point source epidemic point source because all the cases will be exposed to the single 
uh, exposed to the exposure at a single point of time. So, there will be an explosive increase in the number of cases and all the cases will be treated or will be relieved of symptoms at the same time and the, the reduction also will be at the same time. That is why it is called as a point source epidemic. If you look at the curve, it has got a single peak, only one peak cases will rise gradually and then they will fall with a sharp fall. So, that is point source. Now, this is another type of epidemic curve which you need to look at. As you can see, unlike the first one, there are three peaks to this particular curve. And as you see, with every peak, the frequency or the number of cases goes on increasing. So, what happens here is the epidemic is propagated propagated means spreading from one person to another. So, for all the diseases where we expect a person to person transmission, we can have an epidemic curve like this, whereby there will be multiple peaks and the number of cases will go on rising. So, as you can see here, this is another histogram which shows you a propagated or a person to person type of transmission of disease. Why do we need to plot these epidemic curves? Epidemic curves are very important because they can suggest to us what has been the type of exposure, whether it is a point source or it is a person to person or propagated type. Next, it can also show us the time of exposure if we know what the agent is. We can study the time trend which is distribution of cases over time. We can also study the mode of spread, whether it is respiratory route of spread or it has been a blood bone spread or what. Possible agents if we know the time of exposure. So, epidemic curves may show us or suggest to us different types of uh, different types of information. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Finally, we come to outlining the steps of epidemic management and investigation. Firstly, we need to know, look at why do we need to investigate an epidemic. The first and foremost rationale behind doing an epidemic investigation is to identify the source or the place from which the epidemic has come from. And once we identify it, our next step is to eliminate that source. Next is to develop strategies to prevent further outbreaks. Evaluate existing prevention strategies because we need to look at whatever is existing for prevention whether it is working or it is not working we need to look at it we may have to refine it next is to describe new diseases and learn more about known diseases so how do we know that SARS is a disease which could spread or it has gained epidemic proportion SARS was not known to us earlier but based on the epidemic investigation we were able to describe the epidemiology of the new disease also about known diseases, we can identify whether there has been a change in the trend or change in the epidemiology of the disease. And the most important rationale behind doing an epidemic investigation is to address public concern. Because whenever there is an epidemic, there is a panic situation, people are all worried, they have lack of information, they are not aware of what can happen or they are very much um, concerned about their health and health of their loved ones. So, by doing an epidemic investigation and communicating the findings to the people, it is where it is possible to address the public concern or their queries. So, these are the steps in an epidemic investigation which you can refer to in the next lecture recording. The first step essentially is to prepare for field work whereby you collect your you make your team with epidemiologists microbiologists with people who can go and do the survey and and other people needed after which you establish whether there is actually an outbreak by looking at the criteria which you have defined for cases in the outbreak you verify the diagnosis with the help of laboratory investigation establish what you call as a case definition who all will be included for this epidemic investigation to be considered as cases. Having done that, identify those cases and count the cases. So, you are counting the number of cases to perform a descriptive epidemiology whereby you will draw epidemic curves and you will also try to find out what is the prevalence of the condition. 
next is to develop a hypothesis a hypothesis is nothing but a question which you would like to prove or a statement you would like to prove in order to check what is the source of that epidemic and by doing epidemiological studies you can evaluate your hypothesis based on what source has been identified control and preventive measures can be initiated and the final step is whatever findings have been found from the investigation have to be communicated or reported to all those who are concerned that means to the public to the policy makers to the media etc so these are the 10 steps in epidemic investigation which will be detailed in the next session so to summarize understanding of disease transmission is very very much vital or it's the key to control communicable diseases epidemiological investigations are performed and they are required to determine source of outbreaks and to do these investigation we require coordinated efforts which are directed towards control and prevention so that's all about communicable disease epidemiology with reference to control and prevention thank you very much